Hello everyone and welcome to Mental Health Impact Series episode 46. My name is Anshul Vash. I am the CEO and founder of Reach Out Together Foundation, a Canadian mental health awareness company dedicated to empowering you to seek professional help and other resources. Today on our show, we have the one and only Priya Putankar based out of Toronto, Canada to talk uh, to us about the importance of um, having mental health discussions, the importance for us to have a mental health toolkit in place in order to move towards recovery. Thank you so much for everyone that's taking the time to tune in. If you stick around till the very end, I have a gift for you. So stick around to get to know more. Um, welcome, Priya, on the show. It is such a pleasure to have you here. Could you please start off with telling our audience a little bit about yourself and what brought you here today? Definitely, yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me, Anshul, and uh, to reach out together. I am so honored to be here. Um, to everyone, my name is Priya, uh, and I'm a global labeling strategy manager at a pharmaceutical company. Uh, and for what brought me here, a bunch of reasons, but mainly because I'm super passionate about mental health and wellness. Uh, and I feel that um, even though mental health discussions are becoming more common, uh, I really think that we have a long way to go. Um, and so I just want to do my part and contribute to taking this conversation forward. That's amazing. How did you hear about this opportunity to come on our mental health impact series show and share your message to help make a difference in the space. So I actually follow uh, Reach Out Together's Instagram page and Facebook page as well. And um, I saw a lot of great speakers come by and I personally benefited from their experiences and felt like I wasn't alone and I heard similar feedback from other individuals. Um, so, you know, I thought, let me reach out and see how it would be to do my part in this as well. That's remarkable. And how long have you been in this healthcare industry, Priya? Uh, seven years, feels like a lifetime though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm sure you're here today bringing in your experiences, your personal and professional experiences. Yeah. Okay, I'm really excited to get started. Um, today's topic is the mental health toolkit. Um, what is the importance of us to understand what works for us in order to create a list of things that actually is going to help us in recovery. This mental health toolkit is also known as a recovery action plan. So could you touch base a little bit about what is what does your mental health toolkit look like Priya? And how did you come about to create this for yourself? Yeah, sure, I can do that. So maybe for that, I have to go back to what challenges I faced. Okay. And then I can share a bit of light on how that helped me navigate through to creating my toolkit. Um, so in the last few years, uh, I lost, uh, lost some people close to my life in a short period of time. Uh, and this was definitely really challenging for me. Uh, it took me like years to even notice that I was still grieving. Um, and what was sad was that after a year, I started kind of blaming myself for not being strong enough. Because to me, it was like, oh, okay, you, it's been a year, like, get over it, move on, right? So I used to question myself, why can't I stop thinking about this stuff, leave it in the past? Um, and on top of that, it took me so long to even notice that I was blaming myself. Like, I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me that I was blaming myself. So it's really funny how the mind works. Yeah. Uh, and the other challenge that I've always faced in life, which is separate from loss, is uh, my expectation from myself. So I've always offered other people a different level of grace and empathy than I've offered to myself. Um, and I always thought I was right in doing so that, OK, be kind to others. And that's the main goal. So my thought process said, you know, you need to push yourself, strive for perfection, get out of your comfort zone, you know, uh, and all of these statements are, they're not invalid. They're, they're really good to have in your toolkit, but in high dosage, they can be really toxic. Uh, 
like always trying to push yourself from your comfort zone isn't isn't really great because we can lose a sense of grounding when we're trying to always push ourselves mm -hmm. um so my biggest realization was that no comfort zone is not really a great zone to be in in the first place like you need to have some level of grounding and then build up from there and, and the key for that is to have balance which is obviously easier said than done and i'm still working on it so you know uh, what what led me to developing my toolkit is is observing these patterns so patterns like being too hard on yourself striving for perfection um you know blaming blaming myself for having negative thoughts um and um you know putting all the energy towards being being a happy person externally than internally so the few things that helped me and now that i know all this is number one the main thing is that i notice what i'm feeling so every time i'm feeling sad happy excited no matter what feeling i try to note it down just really quickly be like okay i'm feeling sad and then instantly i decide from there should i really think about this more why i'm feeling sad or should i just ignore the thought this thought for now and continue what else i was doing okay that is one thing that i do and the second thing is professional help if you don't mind me asking priya how did you get to that level of mindfulness um so the one thing that helped me a lot is professional help okay i know that a lot of people can do this by themselves and i'm not saying that professional help is the only way to do this uh but for me um what helped with professional help was my therapist was really able to challenge my thought process through different examples and then that challenging kind of spread to me so every time i was thinking about something i asked myself is this the only way of thinking about it or you know am i wrong can i be can i be doing this some other way so that pattern and that conversation with my therapist just helped me realize that there are other ways my way is one way but it's probably not the best way no, so cool. so every time i feel negative thoughts um and i decide okay i'm going to do this make a fear based decision i kind of stop myself now and decide okay am i doing this out of fear am i doing this out of anxiety am i doing this because i really want to right very well said thank you please continue the second thing is Uh, yeah so i was just saying that um you know professional help you know, really helped me organize my thoughts yeah. uh and challenging my patterns and biases um and then one thing that really helped also uh, from the professional help was the uh, was understanding the concept of true self love so which is so funny because it was so alien to me like literally 3 years ago i i didn't get it I I knew that the term I knew self love and everyone spoke about it oh you need to love yourself but I really didn't get it until recently so that was kind of like a ceiling that I pushed past really getting that concept and it takes time but that helped let's talk more about self love because I feel like even when it comes to people accepting that hey something is wrong and i need help or some sort of professional help could help me i think that stems from the belief that hey like this isn't right and i deserve better or i could feel better like i want to help myself you know i i deserve better in terms of my own well-being and so how what are some strategies you recommend priya that have worked for you to understand to become aware that hey i don't think that i'm as kind and as compassionate to myself as i am with other people are the specific strategies that you pursue yourself to become more aware of this and practice certain tools so that you are able to acknowledge yourself more love yourself a bit more right right um so one thing right off the bat for me was when my schedule got really booked up it's most likely because i'm not showing myself much self love and i'm giving my time to other people more than myself 
So there have been days and weeks where I've started meetings at 6 a.m. and ended my day at 11.30 p.m. And that was all by choice, right? Like nobody forced me to do it. But I, that was those moments when at the end of that week, you feel so drained out and you have almost like no energy to even open your eyes. That's the moment when I look back to myself now and I tell myself, okay, this week, your self-love was kind of like five out of hundred. So do better the next week. So you don't feel like this again, because the more time that I give to others and booking my schedule, the less time I have for myself um, to do anything that I want for myself. Like 5 a.m. To, to 11 p.m. is like not a really healthy lifestyle. Yeah. And I absolutely love how you worded it, that you tell yourself, I read myself a 5 out of 10 in self-love this week. Next week, you better do better. That's, that's really nice. Yeah, because I think a part of it, the main thing for me is just noticing because sometimes life just is so busy and you just keep going you move on to the next thing the next thing okay I want to buy a house I want to have kids I want to I want to do this I want to do that there's really no time to stop and it won't come to you no one's going to tell you oh stop and don't do anything you have to make that decision yourself and that took me all of 26 years to understand that's beautiful that at such a young age too you're able to um, acknowledge these things certain traits within yourself and you know actively improve that for the better for a better present really right yeah exactly that's lovely um let's talk a little bit about um anxiety workplace stress because i know priya that you are an, a high achiever you are a person that sets targets and goals for yourself all the time and when you meet it you go like what's next and that's remarkable that's what makes you the leader that you are in your community right um but with that also comes you know a lot of stress with that comes workload with that comes just a lot so could you help our audience who are similar like you you know, who are high achievers, who are high performing individuals. And quite often when we are suffering or when we're not doing well, as high performing individuals, it's not visible to other people. It's harder for us to ask for support because we are like, we are in control. Um, we have got this. No, I can fix this. And so we end up resisting to ask for help. Have you been through a similar experience like that? And if so, how did you acknowledge that and stand up for yourself and your well-being? Oh, yeah, I have definitely been through that. Uh, I'm a chronic case of that, in fact, uh, to a not a great level. Like, not, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm proud of that habit of mine. It's helped me in many ways, but it's also made me not feel great on certain days. So to tackle that, uh, what I've started doing is like aggressively scheduling my life. And, you know, having time to myself every single day, chunks just for myself. Um, so two things I do for that. I made a list of everything that gives me joy. Okay. So this was after a long time as well. My therapist asked me, what do you do for self-love? And I said, um, I exercise. So she asked me, do you exercise for self-love or because that's the right thing to do? And I said, I probably do it because it's the right thing to do. Then she said, what else? Uh, I said, I read a book. She said, is that for self-love or is that because you want to learn more? And I said, mostly because I want to learn more. So then she made me drill down to a point where I had no choice but to really think about what I do for self-love. And the two things that I came up with, one was spending time with my, my family and my dog. Mm -hmm. And the second thing was dancing. Mm -hmm. So now... I schedule time every single day to spend time with my dog. I sit with him for 30 minutes mm -hmm. and like we sometimes talk, it's weird, but we talk. Like I just chat with him like, and I just look at him and I just sit on the floor and meditate and just take that time for myself. Yeah. Um, and then the second thing is really seeing your boundaries and saying no. Yeah not every everything not everything deserves our time and our attention 
um, maybe one week it does, maybe another week it doesn't. And I really think that prioritizing um, what really matters not only helps you, but also others. Because what I noticed is that when I prioritized others, after a week or so, I was dead. I had no energy to give. So the next week, I couldn't give any energy to anyone who really needed it. Not my husband, not my friends, because I was just burnt out, you know. So what I realized is life is really not a sprint, but more a marathon. So I have to treat it as such. Like I can't go one week 80 hours and another week 20 hours because I, I have no energy. It has to be consistent. It has to be what works. What works. I love that. That's so well said. Thank you so much, Priya. Would you say, Priya, that, that you, you, in your personal experience, you've you've witnessed um, stigma, stigma within the space to just have discussions, mainly in the workplace. In the workplace, um, it's really like subtle stigma. Yeah. Unnoticed uh, because especially in Canada, I think mental health is becoming a more commonplace topic, even at workplace. Okay. Um, but I never felt as comfortable uh, speaking to my coworkers, at least earlier in my life, uh, speaking to my coworkers about what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. Because even myself, I felt like, oh, you know what? Maybe that's weak. Or maybe it's, they don't need to know. Maybe I should just, just keep this with me. Um, and that stigma that I instigated on myself. And then there's other, other cues, you know, when people say, oh no, this has to be done. Even if it's like 10 PM, it has to be done. That makes me feel like uh, the, the employee or the company isn't prioritizing the, um, sorry, the employer or the company isn't prioritizing the employee's mental health. Yeah. By just, by just doing that and not even acknowledging that, okay, you, you're working so hard or, you know, so sorry that you need to work after hours. That is a subtle way of deprioritizing people's mental health. And it, in a way, is stigma, even though it's not outright said. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any tips, Priya, that just things that come to your mind that we can put in place to reduce the stigma? I think conversations. Yeah. Conversations is a big one. Having having a you know placeholder to have conversations with your manager with your peers uh, just having check-ins on how you're feeling especially during this time I know I've done that with a few co-workers where you just have check-ins to see how are you doing this is a pandemic uh, this is hard some people are living with their kids some people are are alone some people are living in small places it's it's a challenging time and what I find useful is just having that human connection, that one-on-one, -on -one, just asking, how are you doing? Do you, do you feel okay? Um, is there anything I can do to help? Do you need your workload to be reduced? You know, one week is less busy for me, one week is more busy for you, maybe we could share the load. And I think that open, open dialogue and conversation is just so remarkable. I do agree. I, I believe that creates an open and a safe space for individuals to just tell them what they need in order to work and execute their work successfully. Right. Providing a psychologically safe workforce is the employer's job. Yeah, right. The one thing I'd say though, is that if you don't feel safe in that space though, then it's not easy to have those conversations. So I'm not trying to say that, oh, just walk up to your manager and just be like, hey, I'm not feeling okay. I think before that step, you need to feel a certain level of safety in that relationship. So if you feel that. Yeah, so if you're not feeling safe in that relationship, it's it's not your fault. It's not the other person's fault. You're just not in that level yet. Maybe you'll get there, maybe you won't. Just talk to people who you feel safe with because that's important. And um I personally only do that as a rule of thumb. I only speak with people about my personal feelings only when I feel that level of safety and comfort, even if it's one person in the whole company 
or one person my whole life. That's fine. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, we have a comment here from our audience. It's not their fault. I think people need to know that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. We have another question from the audience here, Priya. And this is with regards to you mentioning burnout. Um, it says, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on burnout, Priya. Are there any advice that worked for you that can help us to ensure that the burnout doesn't repeat itself? Right. Um, physiologically, I think exercising can really help not feel the burnout or reduce the burnout. Yeah. Second is scheduling and prioritizing. So having times for yourself, not overbooking yourself. Um, and really noticing throughout the week how you're feeling. If you're feeling like you're going downhill, mm -hmm. correct midweek, then when it gets too late. Or let's say you have three weeks of project work to do and you're just midway, just have a check-in with yourself. How are you feeling? Are you burnt out? Because you still have half the way to go. If you're already burnt out, you really need to change the way you're doing things, which means saying no to some things, giving away some, some tasks that can be delegated, even at home, right? Like I, I really rely on my husband too. Like I tell him this week is looking so bad for me. Um, I, I need your help. Yeah. There's no harm saying that. And there's no harm doing the same thing at your work too. Just saying I need help because I'm resource trapped. It's as simple as that. There's no shame in it. And it's the realistic thing to do because if you take on all of that and you don't produce quality work, that looks equally bad as well. Yeah. You don't want to give bad quality work. Yeah. So well said, Priya. Thank you so much for being so real here. We have another question from the audience and it says, I think you've touched on this a bit, but I've been reading a few different articles that talk about how a self-care routine is helpful, not only in general, but as a way of staying grounded when there are major changes in your life. What are your experiences with that? Either since the pandemic started or at some other major turning point for you personally? Right. So a year and a half ago, I started my part-time MBA at Rockman okay. um, at University of Toronto. And um, that was a big turning point for me because I was juggling full-time work plus part-time school, um, which was really hard. And I had, I had to navigate a whole different ecosystem with school, a new set of people that I've never met before, new, you know, new courses. I'd never taken any business courses in my life, always been in the science side of things. Yeah. So when I danced and when I played with my dog, things started to feel normal. Things started to feel a bit more grounded. When I met my schools from, from Lagos, um, you know, I, when I when I spent more time with my family, I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just growing. I still have a foundation and I'm growing. It gave me a sense of sense of calm and um, relief that not everything is changing. You know, like my life is not turning all the way around. It's just expanding. That's beautiful. Yeah, I hope that answered the question. Yeah. So ultimately, like, self-care is what still kept you grounded, right? Definitely. Definitely. We have another comment here. Life is not a sprint, but more of a marathon. I love this. Well said, Priya. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, let's wrap this up. Let's now combine and summarize everything we've discussed and revisit what does Priya Patankar's mental health toolkit looks like. From what I've heard so far, we have um, self-awareness um, activities where you question yourself, like on a scale of one to five, how well did I do in terms of self-love self this week, right? That was one of them. Could you please let, let's summarize all of the, the things that are in your mental health toolkit? Yeah, for sure. Uh, self-love, self-awareness, um, seeking help, yes. whoever you want from, professional, personal. Um, 
also this concept of knowing that thoughts are thoughts and thoughts are not facts um thoughts are automatic we can't stop them so it's okay to experience both negative and positive thoughts and when you have a negative thought just note it and ask yourself you know do you want to deep dive into this or no so that's uh, the third one the fourth one is really um prioritizing your work your schedule saying no when you when you can't give more of yourself really learning about your capacity what can you offer how much space and bandwidth you have setting expectations with people accordingly so if you have just 10 hours in this week then that's all you have and that's the way you go with you know setting expectations yeah and uh on the other side i think like um just thinking about exercise and nutrition as one way to supplement your mental health and boost it uh which could really help as well because um studies have shown that you know exercise makes you feel more pumped and more excited and um also gives you better quality of sleep so that i i adhere to trying not to eat very unhealthy food all the time yeah. the work in progress i mean if you're regularly exercising you can right to have that good balance um but that's really well said thank you priya um to wrap this up what is the one message you'd like to leave our audience with people that are tuned in or people that are going to come back and watch this later um perhaps someone that's struggling perhaps someone that's really lost and confused and they they don't have the motivation to actually go out and seek therapy like you did what's the one message you'd like to leave them with um the one thing i would say is just look within yourself i think a lot of answers you have just just dive a deep a bit deeper into what's what's causing you to feel a certain way and start from there see where it takes you maybe that takes you to professional help maybe that takes you to pursuing a goal maybe that takes you to um you know exercising more it could be anything but i think just really taking that time to just notice and sit with those uncomfortable feelings will will help in the long term even though it feels really uncomfortable in the in the short term and i know how uncomfortable it feels i've been through that uh but i honestly feel like there's almost no choice there we we have to face it and then grow from there oh so shall it be or even better priya thank you so much for keeping it real for sharing your time on our show for everyone else that stuck around till the very end or if you've come back to watch this and you're still here i want to offer you something special i published a book last year uh january 2020 uh called success strategies with my mentor jack canfield he's a co-author of chicken soup for the soul book series and um our book won um amazon's best seller list in two different categories instantly 24 hours upon launch my write up in this book won the editor's choice award from the publishing company in los angeles and so if you're watching till the very end i want to offer you the excerpt completely free of cost if you send us an email at info@reachouttogether.com and i promise you that this will help you feel slightly different or look at life slightly differently i would love to know your thoughts if you've read it please send me personally an email to let me know at anshul@reachouttogether.com if you have a story to share if you're a mental health professional wanting to share your wisdom your knowledge your experiences please join us on our mental health impact series show we do this every friday and contact us at event@reachouttogether.com and we will get you on board thank you once again priya for getting on our show it means a lot to us um before we end this could you share with our audience what this hand sign represents This is our logo. Do you know what it stands for? Yeah, so it stands for healing. Okay. Do in you tell us more from your experience? Um in sign language? Yes. Um it's 
It means healing in sign language. That's what I know. Very close, Ria. Very close. So this in sign language actually means together. We use the color orange in our logo because orange in color healing therapy, it brings out feelings of warmth and happiness. And our vision at Reach Out Together is to heal the world together, community by community, conversation by conversation, just like we did today. So from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you for being here to raise awareness on this topic. And I'm sure that it has made a difference for someone that's tuned in. So thank you, Priya. Thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you, everyone who listened. Not a problem. Until next time. See you all next week. Bye for now.